All right, folks, um, just another Wednesday morning. Um, so this is uh, the, the launch video from the um, the launch of the CubeSats. So in the, in the top of that rocket there, we've got three Cubic 50 satellites, the Diari satellite, um, and we'll be hearing quite a lot about all of them in the next couple of days. I'm just going to turn the sound off, and we can get on. All right, so uh, I've welcomed you to the launch function. I'm not going to welcome you again to the workshop. Um, thanks for coming uh, to this. We, we ran one of these two years ago. Um, with the, under the same title, launching CubeSats for and from Australia. Um, I'm uh, Andrew Dempster, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Director of the Australian Centre for Space Engineering Research here at UNSW. Uh, we have been involved in three of those CubeSats that are, um, are being launched there. Um, I think we, I just need to do a few thank yous. Firstly, I'd like to thank Cheryl Brown for organising this because there's been quite a lot of logistic problems with organising this particular pair of events, especially trying to organise them together. So um, she's worked very hard to do that. She's not around, but you know, please acknowledge her when she's <coughs> here. I'd uh, also like to uh, acknowledge the support of Optus, who have provided us with some sponsorship for this event, and that's made it um, more affordable for students and for the startup people tomorrow. Um, like I said, we, we ran, the, ran the first one of these two years ago. We ran on April Fool's Day. Um, <laughs> <coughs> and, you know, I mean, that, at the time, that, that almost seemed appropriate. I, I was actively discouraged by certain people in Canberra from running a thing like this. Uh, when we've got a satellite utilisation policy which says the Australian government does not see an Australian satellite manufacturing or launch capability as an essential element of its approach to assured access to critical space and able services. So hopefully um, we're going to see a change in that sort of attitude soon, um, and I think that this community is responsible for, um, for helping change that attitude. Um, and I guess when we look at what's happened in New Zealand, like New Zealand has a space agency, so in the time since our last CubeSat workshop, Australia has not had a space agency, but New Zealand has. Uh, New Zealand made that decision because Rocket Lab sort of put the government into a position where it couldn't do much else. It really had to change uh, to deal with the fact that real space activity was happening in New Zealand. Um, we're hoping that this type of thing will um, push our own local government in the same direction. Now, um, there's been a hell of a lot happening, and we're going to hear about that over the next couple of days, uh, and that the change is due to the people here uh, to report on what's happened. We've got uh, 43 speakers over two days. We've got 13 startups talking tomorrow. And in fact, I got an email through from Tim Parsons yesterday. He's saying that um, he's identified 34 different startups in the space area in Australia. And pretty much all of those would not have existed uh, two years ago when we ran our first workshop on CubeSats. And a lot of those startups are working in the CubeSat area. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, at the, when, we, when we finished the last one, we said, oh, you'll have another one in, in two years, because at that time, we'll be able to um, report on, you know, QB50 and Viari and how they're operating. So, um, you know, it's been eight hours, guys. <laughs> what, do you, what do you got to tell us? Come on. So we'll hear, we'll hear about that later. Um, so we, we've had real missions, QB50, uh, Biari, Buccaneer. Um, I'm, I'm sort of I'm not following my script. So I've said most of what I was going to say, which is good. Um, but just to, just to drill a little bit on the numbers. The space industry will have an annual turnover of one trillion dollars by 2030. The small satellite market will be worth seven billion by 2020. Compound annual growth rate of about 20%. So it's a very good business to be in. 
these guys who are doing the startup work um, that we'll hear about um, are identifying genuine opportunities. By 2023, the requirement for launches in the 1 to 50 kilogram class will be 320 satellites a year, full market potential of 460 per year. More than 70% of those satellites will be for commercial purposes. And over 3,500 small satellite launches will occur in the next decade. Worth $22 billion. So look, I think things have changed a lot since our last, um, since our last workshop. Uh, and I hope you'll be inspired by the people who are going to they're going to report on what they've been doing. Um, I'm now going to... You've probably been much more interested in this than anything I've had to say. Although, nothing's happening, right? Nothing's happening. Just like you want. Give us, give, give us a boring launch. Okay, so... Now, this is going to happen a little bit over the course of the next couple of days. Is that the chair is going to have to introduce themselves. But it means that that's going to be fairly quick. So I've already introduced myself once, that's enough. So uh, in our program, we've got, uh, I think, three speakers this morning. I haven't got my program there with me. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've done here. I know the original program said this bit was supposed to be what we're going to do. But I think what we're going to do has become more clear with the individual speakers in the next couple of days. So, I'm going to talk for a bit, Ian Cartwright's going to talk for a bit, and Michael <coughs> Um We'll talk about um, CubeSat activities and the way that the um, the way the landscape is looking at the moment. All right, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we've done here and how the CubeSat, the, the actual, the idea of the CubeSat is, is uh, sort of fundamental to a whole lot of different things that we are actually looking at. So we, um, we set up the centre oh, almost seven years ago now, um, and our idea was to, to provide leadership in this area, and these are the things that we do. So historically, we've been quite strong in the area of, of satellite navigation. And that's where a lot of our uh, expertise comes from. And it's where a lot of where we're going um, is, dri is driven from as well. So we've, been, we've worked on satellite navigation terrestrially, and we've done a fair bit of uh, space-based GPS. In fact, that rocket was carrying um, three GPS receivers made here, two different models. So we'll, and that's one of them in that picture. So we're also looking yeah, at other areas of space which we think might be a bit unique where we might be able to establish a niche. I watched the launch video this morning in my office, looked out the window, there was a bunch of black cockatoos flying by, baradas in the local language. Um, that was the name of our project that we ran under the Space Research Program. And there were three main activities, and interestingly, CubeSat, uh, CubeSat's come into each of these. So there was, we, we looked at synthetic aperture radar formation flying, we looked at GNSS receiver design, and we looked at reflectometry. And, you know, it was a big satellite that we were looking at, so it wasn't a CubeSat. But initially, we did look at CubeSats. Uh, for this type of applications that we were looking at, we weren't able to follow up too much on that because um, radars are big, well, they need to be big because they're an active sensor. So although we tried tried our best to try and get that uh, that design into a small format, we couldn't we couldn't do it. Um, oh yeah, sorry. So the GPS receiver that we we built, we built it. We actually built two GSS receivers in that program. One of them was in a CubeSat format, and that was because uh, DSTO, as they were called at the time, came to talk to us about a receiver to go on the Biari mission, which they launched their first satellite on that same rocket last night. Um, and then the reflectometry work that we did, although it's based, we did that work on an aircraft, we're looking at now taking that uh, into 
a CubeSat application. I'll be talking a little bit about that tomorrow in the, um, in the startup session. So the satellite you can see the satellite navigation plays a big role there. And, and we, um, we, the centre, used to live in the School of Surveying in UNSW, which ceased to exist and was split between civil engineering and electrical engineering. And um, in order to, to give us a place where we can collaborate between those two schools, we've created this um, satellite navigation and positioning laboratory, which is where a lot of our um, satellite navigation research is done. We're looking at a number of areas, and interestingly, we've recently launched a product in interference, like finding uh, interference to GPS within two meters. But the ones that are most related to what we're talking about today are these. So we're looking at reflectometry, radio occultation, and um, just the platforms, the GPS platforms that fly in space. There's our generation, so that's first generation, third, second generation, third generation, that's our CubeSat uh, based receiver. So that's the one that flew on Biari. That's that same receiver again. This is the other one that we built for uh, space-based applications. So that's two frequencies, uh, L1 and L5, if you know about those things in GPS. And this, this receiver, which is actually um, now being sold for a company called Kia GNSS in New Zealand, because our collaborator in this area, um, Kevin Parkinson, is in New Zealand. This is the receiver that flew on the two QB50 satellites. So both of those two receivers were in that rocket you saw launched earlier. And using those um, receivers in, um, with, a, with the satellite simulator, we're actually able to get sort of centimeter level relative positioning. So if you've got multiple receivers, you can actually um, position them to that. And you can see that work was done under that Gerard project. So there they are. This is, um, uh, this is the, the UNSW ECO. That's, that's our satellite. This is the INSPY2. So this is in our laboratory here where a few of the um, construction work was done on those two CubeSats. So when we were working with um, Sydney Uni and uh, ANU on this CubeSat, they, uh, they used the same basic uh, bus setup as we had used for ours. And that, that allowed them, that, that, settled, that, that um, project had, a, had some problems. And because they used the, the sort of lower risk approach that we had done there, they were able to more or less, from scratch, get a, a CubeSat out the door in less than a year. Uh, this is one of the very few uh, photographs of our CubeSat with that INS instrument from the BKI integrated because we had to send the CubeSat over there um, to Delft and they, they put it in there. Um, and there weren't a lot of photographs taken of it after the um, this was, was integrated. Now, another thing which is probably only of real interest to university people is what CubeSats have done in helping us with our research, right? So we've actually won two, uh, so the first one's a linkage project, and the second one's a discovery project. And the strength of these projects was um, enhanced by the fact that we had a spaceborne platform to do the testing on, right? So the idea of the CubeSat having an, being an end in itself um, is not necessarily the end of the story. Because we were able to say, look, we've got a CubeSat, we can run these tests on the CubeSat. Um, and we think that both of those uh, projects were helped over the line by the fact that we had this unique um, test board that we could do our experiments on. So there's the, uh, the, the board that we're, we're talking about doing those tests on. Most of this stuff I'm not going to do, go through in any detail because we will hear about it later. So we've got four experiments on our CubeSat. Uh, three are payloads and one is the structure. We don't need to talk in too much detail about that. One of the things that I personally like about this project is just the large number of people who are involved in it. Different levels, undergraduate, postgraduate, um, not that many staff. Some staff who work very hard, the one over there for instance. Um, but lots of people. And so this project has given these students hands-on <coughs> Hands-on experience of something that they, you know, there would have been a lot of people on this list watching that video last night, thinking that's my work going into space. 
Uh, we're also involved in the Biari project. Uh, Eamon's not here yet. He's uh, probably going to talk about that later. Uh, and again, that, um, oh no, there he is. Are you tweeting this, by the way? Uh, no. <laughs> You're supposed to be the official tweet person. Um, okay. So yes, there we are at the Air Force Research Laboratory. Uh, again, flying that, flying that. We'll hear about that later. Now, the reflectometry stuff, like I said, this, this lived in the Garada project as an airborne experiment. And stupidly, I've had this, I've had this image for ages, right? And it had not occurred to me that you could use this for looking at the floods. We've just had these floods in northern New South Wales and Queensland. Um, nicely differentiates between land, you know, wooded land and water, and wooded land and cleared land. So this is looking at reflected GPS signals from the surface of the Earth. Uh, we're looking at all sorts of applications for this, but I'll talk tomorrow about, particularly about sea state, because that's where um, some of our research is heading. But looking at it both on an airborne platform and on a satellite platform. The Off Earth Mining uh, Initiative that we're running here, again, is a nice model, something that keeps the dean happy, because I'm talking to six schools of engineering, uh, as well as different um, partners and, and even across five faculties. But you might not have thought that uh, this is something where CubeSats have a role. Um, we've, we've run two of these off-earth mining forums. The next one is in September. And we've identified all these areas of research. But if you look at the PhD topics which are currently being examined under the off-earth mining, a number of those can be um, examined in the CubeSat context. In a broader way, we've got another PhD student who's looking at um, deep space applications for CubeSats. This is one application to that, but he's looking at it in a broader, a broader way. Now Barnaby, who was mentioned earlier, is doing an experiment on the uh, space station called SMILE, and I've just put this in here because it lives in a one new frame. It's not actually going to be a standalone satellite. So like I say, a lot of this work that's being done by um, the startups that we'll be hearing from tomorrow, <coughs> that little community is being held together by Delta V, particularly Tim Parsons, who unfortunately won't be able to lead that session tomorrow. Um, Jason Held will, will do that instead. Um, that's the only photo I know of that's got all the founders of Delta V in it. But I think we'll see the fruits of our labours in that area um, tomorrow. Just a mention of balloons. I, um, Elias will, will talk a little bit about the stratospheric balloon work, I think, later today. Could be tomorrow. Um, but the, the point of this is this is a, a nice stepping stone to doing your trials for uh, CubeSat um, payloads prior to actually putting them on a satellite. A bit more of a plug for the stuff. We, we do a lot of outreach. You're all sitting here being reached out to. Um, you can see that we've got uh, a number of things going on. Here we are today. We've got the Off Earth Mining Forum in September. We also run the International um, GNSS uh, Conference, which is the sort of Australian Satellite Navigation Conference. A second project under the Space Research Program was the Warrable Project, which is run by Elias. And the reason I'm um, mentioning that is that there's a big project part of that project uh, in, in that um, new master's degree, and that project is CubeSat based. So you can see that we, we're looking at, um, and you can see this is, a, this is a sort of CubeSat development platform, which is in the satellite laboratory to, um, to perform those, those projects. Now this is um, BlueSat, which also the Dean uh, mentioned. They, this, that is the BlueSat, was the, the group was named after that object which was what they worked on for over a decade. <coughs> and they have now moved on from this also to be working on CubeSats. So apart from everything I've already mentioned, um, we're hoping to do a bit more work with schools. There's a couple of initiatives where um, schools are starting to show an interest in uh, developing CubeSats. 
and we're hoping that some of the publicity from last night's launch will, um, will get a bit more attention for that. Uh, we actually have three applications in with the ARC at the moment that are CubeSat related. Um, the first one's a discovery on synthesizing apertures in space. The second one's a satellite innovation laboratory, which would be, a, that's a, so that's a discovery grant. This is a LEAF grant, and this is um, an ITRP, an industrial training, uh, can't remember the, what the acronym is. Transformation. Transformation, Industry Transformation Research Program. Uh, and I'll talk, I'll talk a bit more about Genesis Remote Sensing. So, I hope I, I brought us back on time. We started late and I have spoken for less time than... I, I, I commend my own work to other chairs throughout the day for bringing myself in on time. Um, I'd just like to look... I haven't got any bio or anything for you, but... Was, this is um, the account right from the um, DST group responsible for the RE and other things. Morning, everyone. Um, Are you, do you have my slides?